In this lecture, we talk about the invariant Kalman filter. Using what we built so far, we want to talk about a filtering method that uses exponential coordinates. This is a filter from the family of symmetry-preserving observers. It respects the structure, the geometry of the space. It doesn't break the symmetry, and that leads to interesting properties that we will study and try to understand today. So this is a milestone for the course, this lecture and the next one. Uh, this is the last topic on the filters, basically. We covered a bunch of filters that you can use for state estimation tasks, and that should give you a good set of tools for a variety of engineering problems. Not just robotics, and not just a particular application that we might use, maybe localization, but um, in general, it will be very useful for your career. After that, we will focus on cameras, point clouds, SLAM, RGBD cameras, and some other problems that is more related to perceiving the environment, mapping, and so on, okay? So I try to highlight some of the topics that we covered and not to repeat them. So we can focus on the main ideas related to a particular method that we want to learn. So I do not intend to repeat some of the reminders in depth throughout this lecture. Now the motivation in general is for people to study this type of problems and do research on it is because a large class of systems, when you study them using matrix Lie groups, they exhibit natural symmetries. We've seen some of it. Some of the calculations are more intuitive in some sense. And error propagation, last time we observed that that was in particular simpler. It was similar to linear error propagation. Once we derived the result, it was easy. The process, of course, was a little demanding, depending on how much background you have in that area. Now, the theory of invariant observer design is about deriving an estate estimator that is invariant under group transformation. That means the error does not change when we transform it using a group matrix to another point, meaning rotating it or translating it or rotating and translating at the same time. That should not, in principle, change the behavior of the filter. And the goal is to, capturing, to capture that in a mathematically sound way and we can see it in our calculation. So there's a clear objective why we go through the math. And one, if we want to summarize, one fundamental result is that there is a choice of coordinates that will lead to a trivial error dynamics. The question is, what is that choice? For certain problems that we will see what type of problems, that choice is the exponential coordinates, okay? So it's not for any problem, for a class of problems. But that class of problem, uh, problems, it happens to be very frequently occurring in robotics. A lot of sensors that we use, a lot of problems that we study fit into that class of problems. So that makes it very useful for us. Now, we talked about the error modeling. Last time we learned that if we're working with a matrix group, the correct way to define the error is using inverse of a matrix and matrix multiplication. So that the result, which is an error in terms of, in form of a matrix, 
First of all, be part of the group, because the error will be a group element. Whereas if you add or subtract, it won't be, because it violates the group rules for operation and closure. Now here is a graph that shows what happens when we respect that structure and what happens when we don't. The true propagation here, which is a 2D plane with orientation. You can think about it as 3D or 2D, but we're looking at it from the top view. So the true Monte Carlo propagation is the green. That means we draw random samples and then evaluate the process. As the robot move, the robot is moving forward, we get this banana-shaped covariance or distribution for the possible locations of the robot. Now, when you, we use a right invariant EKF to do the same propagation, it's almost exactly capturing that shape, as if we're not losing anything. Whereas the typical way to do it, which was called quaternion EKF, was to model the rotation correctly using quaternions, or you could do it using SO3. That's not a problem. And then define the translation error separately using just a delta. Now, when you decouple these two and you ignore the action of rotation on the translation as the robot is moving and rotating, that leads to not being able to capture this basically nonlinearity correctly. Although just for the rotation is correct, but when it's combined with translation and velocity, it can, it can lead to inconsistency and bad performance, but there is an area that they might overlap, and this filter, of course, works well if this effect is a small. Small rotation, small error, good initialization. These are cases that we might not see this. But we are aware of this limitation when we decouple the translation and orientation. Another example you see in the bottom is these circles. Imagine you start from a location somewhere here. Your eyes are closed. I turn you around several times, and you have no idea what is your direction. Well, you know where you are, wherever you are. That's your initial position. But you have no idea what direction you're moving if you start walking. Now you start walking, and you move forward. In terms of translation, you roughly know how much you're walking. Some small error, maybe, but that's not a problem. You can count your steps, and you know how much you move forward. What about your orientation? It's 360 possibility, right? You could be anywhere. Let's say you're starting from here, you move this much. I'm just visualizing it at a particular time step, but of course, it's growing continuously. You could be anywhere. That's not possible to know unless you open your eyes or somehow you get a measurement that tells you that maybe you're facing somewhat this area, and then that will reduce your uncertainty immediately just to this part, right? So we get rid of all the uncertainty, and that's basically what Kalman filtering is doing. You're tracking a posterior distribution. When you get measurement, this measurement will cut through the uncertainty and leaves a mass for the posterior that is more likely, given the prior and given the evidence, the observation. So that's basically the essence of this sensor fusion and Kalman filtering. Collect data, fuse it, make it better. Make the estimate or posterior better. Now, however, how do you model this, cir this circle? You can't model it using this filter. 
what it will do for you if you decouple the, the error, you'll have to track a dense covariance for the whole space, right? And at some point, because you're thinking about orientation and translation as just different directions, right? And you define your error. You're not able to decouple the correlation across your dimensions. This filter does not respect the fact that uncertainty that is caused by your yaw angle must remain along that direction. Should not be propagated through the other dimensions if it's not related to them. Okay, it's as simple as that. You get a spurious correlation across different dimensions, which is in a sense is inconsistency. And that correlation, it will grow and makes everything uncertain. It's not just your orientation, it's actually where you are. It can be anywhere here, right? And do it not long enough, this ellipse is so big that it's useless. So, with something like the invariant Kalman filter, we can propagate uncertainty consistently along a particular dimension that we are lacking observation. Okay, that's the power of this filter. So the rest of the lecture is to just nail down some equation in math and algebra so we can implement this. This is why we need this. This is the problem it will solve for us. The question is, is there any weakness? Of course there is, but relative to the previous filters, no. Because it is a generalization of those filters. Now again, this is, if you are working on a problem that the state evolves on a matrix Lie group and satisfies certain properties that we're going to talk about it, then it doesn't have any weakness, relatively speaking, as if, if you use a typical EKF or quaternion EKF, okay? But with respect to a broader idea of inference, yes, of course, it's a specific method for estimation. There's a particular assumption how the update rule should be, and in a sense, it's, it's like extended Kalman filter, right? Extended Kalman filter cannot do what particle filter does. That doesn't render that algorithm useless. It is good for a certain application, right? So, given the right context, it does not have weakness. You're saying, should this be both? We're going to talk about it. You have two options. That's what we're going to talk about. Please be patient. <laughs> but you're seeing the output, and it makes you super curious, right? This differential equation here, this is the result. So thanks for pointing it out, that the outcome is that the error in the group here, which is nonlinear, is captured by a group element, something like this. You can relate this to a Lie algebra element using exponential map. And this is just a Lie algebra element. And you can, of course, think about it as a vector. Now, today, when I write exponential, what I mean is KC hat, right? Previously, you've seen that. This should not be confusing, just to keep it simpler. Otherwise, it makes 
the writing no, uh, busy. It's understood that this is the exponential of a matrix, and once you pass this vector, you need to make, take the hat of it and then take the exponential map, right? In your implementation, you can handle this. Therefore, with agreement, you can drop it to keep things simpler. But anyway, the, the error will follow a log linear in logarithmic sense because we need to take the log of this exponential map. Will, will be governed only by an autonomous differential equation. Given an initial condition, we can recover the error at any time in the future exactly. And then we're going to see why and how. Let's start with a motivating example. Now consider a linear time invariant system, an LTI system, in form of the state space representation. You have a system matrix A and the input matrix B. The system is deterministic. There is no noise. A and B are our model. We know them. And time invariant means they are fixed. They don't vary with time, although they can. That's not a big problem. Define the error to be the difference between the true state x and the estimate of x, x bar, which for the estimated state x bar, we get this dynamics, right? True x will be, of course, replaced by the estimate, and then that's how we can talk about the imperfect system. Now, the time derivative of the error is x dot minus x bar dot. If you substitute the respective equations from here, we end up with just the matrix A times the error. So this is interesting because the time derivative of the error for linear, deterministic linear time invariant systems is only a function of the error itself. Given an initial error, an initial condition, this is an ODE, matrix ODE, we can recover the error at any time exactly using the solution of this differential equation. A is constant, so we can just write it like this. If it's time variant, then we have to integrate. You can talk about the delta t, assume it's fixed during a delta t. So this observation is true for linear systems. And that's very attractive. That's what makes linear systems so attractive. The linear Kalman filter covariance calculations are independent of the state. In fact, they can be done offline and be deployed online. That's what people used to do when computational, basically, resources were really limited on hardware. Now, the error propagation, the lesson we learned is that the error propagation is independent of the system trajectory, the state estimate. This is the true, this is the estimated trajectory of the system as it evolves over time, which is a vector itself, or it can be a matrix later. And the true system trajectory is x of t. Why this is useful? Yes, so you're saying the error has a general equation and we can recover it at any time. Now, what is the consequence of that for our algorithm? Something like a linear Kalman filter. Uh, 
Simpler, something simpler. What if my est estimate x bar, it is far from x, the true estimate, the true trajectory? What if my estimate is not so good or my initialization is not so good? And at some point, the filter is not giving a so good answer, it's just far. What happens to the error? Will that affect the error evolution in the next step? It does not. Now that's, very that's a very powerful consequence because no matter how far from the true trajectory, the error will evolve independent of that and hopefully under some regularity conditions, it, it will converge to zero, okay? And that's, that's what we're after for this invariant Kalman filter. I guess, I guess uh, I'm understanding how the error propagates these kind of specific trajectories to the same thing. Just because if we, I think I'm confusing it with the, with the error being independent from the trajectory versus the error propagation being system trajectory. Well, it's, you're saying what is the relationship between the error being independent of, of the system trajectory, me, meaning we don't see x here, and the propagation. The propagation is just solving this equation forward in time. So this, the solution of this differential equation forward in time is the propagation, which is the, we call it prediction in, in the Kalman filter algorithm, we call it the prediction state. Propagation is another name for that step. Okay, solving forward in time without any correction. So because the covariance is just expands if we predict or propagate. Unless you get a measurement, right? It won't shrink. Thank you. Does it assume that your initial error estimate has to be fairly accurate? Because if you don't, then your starting point will be always off. Does this mean the initial error condition must be accurate? No. It can be anything. Given any initial error, this result holds, right? So that's not limited to that. And somebody asked, is x dot time derivative? Yes. When I write Dot means it's the time derivative. I do not have any control over which one I write. So when it's dot, it's the same as d over dt. So that observation is something that we wish to replicate for a nonlinear observer. And that's what we will see. Now let's continue to motivate this further and for, a, for, a exam, for an example that will contrast it even more, consider the 3D orientation estimation. We have an IMU, inertial measurement unit sensor, but we are just looking at its gyroscope. The sensor is attached to the robot or a rigid body as it moves. You can read directly the angular velocity measurements of the sensor. It will tell you the rate of rotation about this frame that you see here attached to the sensor, x, y, z, as it moves. So it's always in the body frame. Physics can only give us the measurements in the body frame. Now let's say using your undergrad knowledge, you learned Euler angles, you know how to model rotation, and you wanna model a process dynamics for the gyroscope. Now the goal is to, first of all, define your parameters. Our parameters are Euler angles, I'm using Q here. You could use other 
notation, roll pitch yaw. This is z by x, but you could use any other convention. It doesn't matter. So I have a sequence of three independent rotations. If I choose to work with this convention, z, y, x, the product of three of them will give me a rotation matrix, about three axes. Now the goal is to derive the rate of change of these Euler angles, rho pitch yaw, which is not in the body frame. It is with respect to my inertial frame, fixed frame, or world frame. I want to relate the rate of change of these Euler angles to the angular velocity that I read from the sensor. Then I can integrate it, okay? Now this is the same thing as when I say r dot equals r omega. This is indeed the gyroscope process model. However, if you are parameterizing your rotation using Euler angles or any other parameterization that you choose, then of course you're interested to know the time derivative of these parameters with respect to the angular velocity, right? So it is a choice for parameterization of the rotation here. And all their angles basically provide the convenience of parameterizing the rotation using three numbers, angles. Because your rotation is completely captured by them, right? So we work with the time derivative of the parameters. No, E is a matrix that, well, you don't know how to get it. I'm going to tell you how, although I'm not going to derive it. I shared on Piazza today code and references how to get this, and I have a line that should be clear how to do it. You should be able to reproduce it in less than a minute in MATLAB, but it takes a little more to think about it. So there is a matrix that is called Euler angle rate matrix. What it does, it rela relates the rate of the angular velocity to the rate of the Euler angle. In a sense, it is a Jacobian, right? So it is a Jacobian that relates velocity in some coordinates to another. That's what it's doing. It's just more specific. It has a more specific name. So it is a Jacobian in the chosen coordinates, z, y, x, rho, p, g, Now, how to derive this matrix? I, I'm, we, we've done the calculation. This is the solution, which does depend on rho, p, g, itself. You remember that the angular velocity in the body frame, it is transpose of the rotation times r dot, which is exactly what I wrote here. We established this. Well, if that's the case, from the chain rule in calculus, we know that to evaluate, to evaluate the time derivative of r, I can talk about its derivative with respect to some intermediate parameters times time derivative of those parameters. That's what we're doing. Now, however, R is a matrix, right? To take the derivative, we go through all its entries. So you will get a double sum, right? Three rows, three columns, nine elements. So this IJ is for going through all entries of R. Now, for each of the entries, we need to calculate this with respect to three parameters. So you get a third sum, k, which basically we need to add, add them up, right? Derivatives for each entry of the matrix 
for roll PGR. You want to know the rate of change of your matrix entry with respect to all the parameters. These are coupled, right? So we had to add the effect for a linear Jacobian term to appear for us. Now, this will give you a matrix. I name it E inverse. That's just what I do because I want to call E the matrix to be the one that when I multiply by the angular velocity, it will give me Q dot. Otherwise, it, does, it's, it's, it doesn't have to be inverse in this direction, right? So in a sense, it is the Jacobian of Ma uh, of basically the angular velocity in this particular choice of coordinates. So in any case, this is our process model. We can derive it. Now this, this way of doing it is nice because it doesn't matter you choose z, y, z, x, y, x, any other choice of coordinates, this is true. Whatever you use to parameterize your rotation, you can use this formula to get this Jacobian. If you do choose your exponential coordinates, that will give you something called group Jacobian, because it's intrinsic to the group. All right, so we get the process model. What happens if I, and there is a library here as well. You can go to this link. It's already implemented for you. You can just clone this repo and use it. Now, what happens if I define a delta that is the difference between Q and an estimate of Q? Error. I'm defining the error term for the Euler angles. This will give me some error dynamics. But probably it won't be nice because the A matrix, that, that E matrix, was not constant or linear. It was nonlinear. So terms get coupled because of nonlinearity. It's not that easy as factoring the matrix multiplied by the error. So I get an error dynamics that is nonlinear. I leave it to you. To make an attempt to derive it, and I'll help you to write it down if you're stuck. If you do the calculations, and then you linearize with respect to the error term, just like a Taylor expansion, with respect to the variable that we're interested to build a linear model around it, you will get this matrix. Let's call it A. Now, the problem is this matrix is a function of the input, but that's not a problem. This is the input. And the state estimate, that does not match our vision of being similar to the linear system. So wherever you are, to propagate, to integrate this Euler angles using gyroscope data, you do need to have an estimate of the global orientation of the object. If that estimate is not correct, that will affect your integration as you move forward. If it's not correct, meaning that it's the, there's a delta that is large enough, because the estimate is it's never the true value usually, until it, unless it converges. But if the delta is large, each time you integrate, this matrix is becoming more wrong, right? Wrong estimate, wrong propagation. Wrong propagation, more wrong estimate. More wrong estimate, more wrong propagation. So it creates a positive feedback loop. Now, depending on how severe it might be, that's, that's the reason the filter might diverge, okay? So it's very important to initialize it correctly and have a reasonably correct estimate 
of the state depending on the problem. So this is the core of the problem. The linearization of the error dynamics, it does depend on the errors, uh, on the state estimate. And this creates a positive feedback loop. Now let's look at the same problem through the lens of Lie groups. Now consider a process dynamics that process model that evolves in a Lie group. You've seen it before. We worked with this type of models, but it can be in general more complicated models as well. So X is an element of the group. X bar is the estimate. To define the error, we can multiply the error from left or right by the inverse of the true state. Now for Euclidean case, It doesn't really matter because it's just a negative of the same error. And especially if you want to calculate the covariance, it doesn't matter at all because it's a quadratic term, the negative sign will disappear. For matrices, you will get different results. It won't be the same covariance. So that leads to two options, left and right. Now it doesn't matter so much Sometimes it makes sense to use left, right. That's not something to be worried about. But it does matter to stick to one and go through that convention for the problem. Okay, not inconsistently switching between left and right equations. Other than that, it's, it's not a source of concern. Okay, so that leads to the definition of the left and right invariant error. We, last time we defined the left invariant error. This is the same thing. Define the error to be the estimate times the inverse of the true state. If you translate each term, both of them with another group element like L, from the right side, it will disappear. It leaves the error invariant because you have x bar t l, l inverse x, x bar, right? So this r means it's right invariant. Now you do it from the left side. When you multiply from l from the left, you get the same property. So we call it left invariant. So we have two options. Notice that the L can be any group element. It's not, it's true across all possible transformations. These are left and right invariant error definitions. We have two main theorems. The first one that we try to understand, and it's somewhat straightforward to prove, is that for what class of functions we get an error dynamics that only depends on the error and not the state estimate. If it depends on the input, it's okay. Because input is something you read from the sensor and you know it, it's the command. The important part is the state estimate, something that we do not know. So for, the question is, for what class of functions or process models evolving in a Lie group, we get an error dynamics that is like this. You do not see x. 
Now, working backward from here, you can show that the process model, this is a continuous time process model, must satisfy this right-hand side property. And the proof that I encourage you to make an attempt is that substitute the definition of the right invariant, right? Now take the time derivative, it's the product, it's the time derivative of the first one, plus uh, times the second one, plus the first one times the time derivative of the second one. You need to deal with the inverse of a matrix, but that's okay, you have, in, you have a formula for that. Now you know that x dot is f of u, right? Substitute the process model into that equation, you will arrive at some, a bunch of terms. Now the key is that if this is true for, let's say x1 and x2, or if this is true for, is that enough? For x1 and x2, it's true for any group element. Once you arrive at that point, you substitute one of them with the identity, right? Because that's very nice. If it's true for any group element, let's pick one of them to be identity, and then you, you will arrive at this. So I don't intend to spend the lecture time for proving that, but that's a good topic to go through it. What is nice about it is that for the process model that satisfies this property, and it's really just plugging in and checking if it does later, I give you a process model, you plug in here, if it satisfies, it is. If it's not, it's not. We get error dynamics that is already defined. It is completely defined by the process model itself, the error and the process model at the identity. So it's a really headache-free calculation using the result of the theorem. You have the error dynamics if the process model is group affine. For the left, you get another equation, okay? This is called autonomous error dynamics theorem in the work of Baru and Bonabel. They proved these two theorems and published the invariant extended column filter paper. I shared the journal link with you. It's published on IEEE transaction on automatic control. If you like to do research, these are good topics to go through and learn the proofs. Otherwise, using the result is fine. Now we're, got, now we're going to talk about the second theorem. This is for the general matrix Lie group is not trivial to prove. It has some involved steps. For SO3, rotation group is actually straightforward and I'll prove it for you. But it is true for all matrix Lie groups. So this is called the log linear property of the error. The property that we were after, that the error evolves independent of the state estimate. Let's define this to be a vector version of the Lie algebra element, right? So A is a matrix that whatever is the dimension of the Lie algebra will be a square system matrix. If it's SE3, A will be six by six because the twist is a six dimensional vector, okay? So for SE3, the dimension of the Lie algebra is six. What is the, which is the dimension of the group 
for a rigid body in 3D. Now, the theorem is telling us that if we have, let's say, the right invariant error, you could pick left as well, between two trajectories that possibly far apart, if an initial condition is given such that from the initial error in the Lie algebra, using the exponential map, we can recover the initial nonlinear error, then for any time, any t forward in time, we can exactly recover the nonlinear error using time evolution of the error in the Lie algebra. And the time evolution of the error in the Lie algebra is governed by this autonomous differential equation. It, does, it only depends on CT, it does not depend on T or other terms. So it's very powerful, powerful in the sense that given an initial condition, we can exactly recover the nonlinear error. That's what exactly we were able to do for the linear system, which was actually exponential of the system matrix. So it is actually very similar to that, right? Some of you don't believe me from your, from the look you're giving me. <laughs> I'm talking about this term. What is the difference? Can see is just another vector. A is a matrix. Now you, you, you should ask, where do you get A? And if that's exact, right? And that's, that's basically it. The main result of the theorem is that you can get an A, and it is exact, the linearization. And we're going to show it for SO3. So there is a choice of coordinate system for matrix Lie groups that gives us this autonomous differential equation for error evolution. Okay. A reminder, you know by now, we established that the differential equation of a Lie group is something like this. And this is true for all Lie groups. We have that, and this will give us a kinematic equation of motion. And SO3 happens to model the gyroscope. This is a little formalized version of that. This is, in differential geometry, this is called a push-forward map. That is why, when I draw that shape, we could move from one tangent space to another tangent space. That is through a push-forward map that helps us to translate terms from one tangent space to another. And for Lie groups, it ends up being just the group element itself. So that's beyond the scope of uh, this lecture, but what we care about is that what we established that the differential equation for each group has this form. The error in the last time, MGT here, is not defined yet. Uh, yes, error. No, this is not. This is independent of the previous slide. I'm just saying, for every Lie group, we have this differential equation. Yes. It's a reminder because I'm going to use it here. Okay, now let's revisit that example that we covered using Euler angles using 
the exponential coordinates of SO3. Same problem, there's a gyroscope, we read angular velocity from the sensor. If the state evolves as a matrix, as an element of SO3, the dynamics is basically R dot equals R omega is Q. And these are direct measurements we're reading from the sensor. So what is your, this is your homework four, by the way, attitude estimation. I'm gonna give you real data from an IMU, the exact picture I showed you. We just collected in the lab. And you need to estimate the orientation of the sensor by integrating the gyroscope and then using the accelerometer to correct it. It's a baby attitude estimation problem. It won't give you the final nice output that you get when you buy an IMU, but it's a building block of that. You will need to do more like using magnetometer and maybe calibration, including the bias terms and all of that. But once you can solve the basic version of that, it's, it's so much easier to build on that. So that's your homework four. All right, let's start from the definition of the left invariant error. I'm choosing left because it will give us something that you can see. If I choose right, the error dynamics will be zero. It's just so simple that it is a little boring. So to not to get that zero, I'm using the left invariant example. To start from the definition of the error and take the derivative. You take the derivative of the error, some direct calculations will give you So this is R dot transpose, and then we know R dot is R omega. We substitute it. Then again, we know this is the error definition. We arrive at this line. And then define it to be G. It is a function of the error, the left invariant error, and the angular velocity. It does not depend on the estimate. So it is this particular choice of the state, an error variable, yields an autonomous error dynamics already. Now let's linearize it. And the way we linearize it, it is actually easier because you don't have to go through calculating the derivatives and taking the Jacobians. So we just replace the nonlinear error with an exponential of the Lie algebra error, the vector space that we want to work with, and then do a first order approximation of the exponential map. It is a series, just keep the first two terms. The first one is the identity, the second is the variable, and drop everything else. This is called a first order approximation. Now, substituted to the error dynamics that we just arrived, they just derived, which was exponential of C and omega. Carry on the calculations, the time derivative of the identity plus. You can see, obviously, this will be zero. In this line, I'm using the property that you see here. We directly recognize that this is the Lie bracket of C and omega. For 3D rotation, uh, 3D rotation group, the Lie bracket was the cross product. So we can actually make it easier. The Lie bracket of A and B is the cross product of A and B and then take the hat again to make it a matrix. So if you use this property we actually arrive at this term. 
Now, apply the V operator to both sides to make them a vector, to make uh, each side a vector, then we get the linearized error dynamics in the Lie algebra. And the A matrix here is actually the negative of omega skew. It is independent of the state, but it does depend on the angular velocity readings from the sensor. But again, that's okay, because that's something that we read from the physics of the problem. So that's an example of that matrix A. What's the natural question to ask? What do we lose? I just told you to linearize and it said okay. I mean, maybe we lose something. Then it won't make it exact, right? Now notice that this is nice and we can work with this. But it only replicates the linear system if it's exact. If it's not, it's just maybe a nicer framework to work with. It does not hold any theoretical properties. Now we're gonna show that this is exact. Although we linearized, the magic of that theorem, second theorem, is that the higher order terms will vanish. Now we're gonna prove it, prove that this is exact. Now consider the initial error as we discussed. Now make a guess that this is the solution of the aerodynamics. So I'm gonna make a guess that given the initial error, the nonlinear error at any time is R transpose times the initial error times R. How do we know this is a solution? Let's take the derivative of the, this candidate. When you take the derivative of this, you replicate the aerodynamics. Therefore, this is the solution to that differential equation. Given the existence and local existence and uniqueness of the solution to ODEs. From that result in math, so that's, that's, that's a correct guess. Now starting from here, let's replace the nonlinear error with the exponential of the Lie algebra error. We recognize this is the adjoint property, so it will be the exponential of R transpose to C zero. So the error, at F, the error in the Lie algebra at any time is completely described by the initial error in the Lie algebra. It is just the R transpose version of that. Now, let's differentiate this term here. What we get is R dot transpose. R dot is R omega, substitute it into the equation, the transpose will change the order, the transpose of the skew-symmetric matrix will add a negative, and we recover that log linear equation. So we just recover the same equation that we arrived at by linearization, starting from the exact solution of the aerodynamics. So, we just proved that we did not lose anything by the previous linearization. That is very surprising. That's not something we expect. And that's why it took a long time to see this result in the literature in this explicit way. 
So that's very interesting that we can integrate the gyroscope data and we can propagate the error independent of the orientation estimate. That sounds nice, given that we solve the attitude estimation problem frequently. Pretty much on every platform that we have an IMU, we, we solve attitude estimation. By the way, the Euler mat rate matrix, if you go back, there is a particular angle when pitch is 90 degree, make the Jacobian singular. And that is a problem too. We don't have this, that problem here. So that singularity is also taking care of it here. So Jen Yuan is asking, does that mean for Kalman filter, the A matrix makes the system globally stable? In a state estimation, we're concerned with observability. We'll see if the system is observable. You can, however, of course, look at the linear system and talk about the stability as well. Now that is true that you don't want an error that when you integrate obviously explode if it's unstable. But the matrix exponential is convergent for all matrices, right? So no matter what, this will converge to a matrix in the group. So we don't have that particular concern uh, in this case. So it is a very nice framework. You don't face any unexpected, unusual problem. All right, so, so this was all true for deterministic systems. Although it's very useful, we need to bring in the noise term. When you bring in the noise term, the theoretical result is lost. Those theorems no longer hold for the stochastic process. However, the performance in practice is still very good. Right? Even though noise will corrupt that, the, the theoretical result, Still, this is a preferred method in practice. We don't lose that much that we fall back onto the previous methods. So it turns out that the right way to define for a continuous time model, the noise term is like this. We add the system matrix times a noise term. This is not omega, this is noise. We can show that there is an equivalent model for the aerodynamics when you introduce the noise into the process, and it shows up like this. For the right invariant, there's an adjoint that is coupled with the noise, and that depends on the state estimate. So to map the noise where we are, or back to the Lie algebra, we do need to know where we are currently located. So that's, unfortunately, that shows up for mapping the noise. But the good news is, it, is that it does not show up still for mapping the covariance of the process model itself. And that's good. That, that's the bigger problem. And for the left invariant part, we get this aerodynamics. So this is what we will be working with because we do need to introduce noise in practice. Now this was all about the process models. Now we want to talk about the observation models. What is a class of equivalent observation models that will work nicely with, within this framework? There are two definitions that will help us to
create that filter that we're after. The left invariant observation model must have this form. Your measurements, which is a vector, equals the state as a matrix times a vector that is constant, and we define it, we pick it, you'll see in examples what to be, plus noise. The right invariant is your measurement equals the inverse of the x times b plus v. Now, you might think this is very, again, limiting, but it is not. This, this covers a lot of problems that we're interested in solving them. So this is structure must be true for the observation model. It cannot be just any nonlinear. Now, a, a remark is that if your process model does not satisfy, there's a question for you. If the process model does not satisfy the group affine property, or the observation model does not fit into any of these two categories, what, what will happen? Can we still use this filter that you haven't seen yet? Somebody saying no? No? Yes, we can. It's just not an analogous to that linear error propagation anymore. It is just the nonlinear Kalman filter on Lie groups. Because we do need to linearize to build something like EKF, extended Kalman filter, but you don't get any surprising result from your linearization because it doesn't possess the structure we need. So it doesn't disqualify the problem from basically being used in the state estimation. It's just the filter will be nonlinear in the sense that the extended Kalman filter was just an approximation to a nonlinear problem. Okay? Now, to show that something like ex the extended Kalman filter will converge and will be stable, you need a whole bunch of assumptions and list of eigenvalues for all the terms. And that is proven by Professor Griesel here sometime in the 90s. A few years after I was born. <laughs> we don't have to go that far back. Um, but in practice, for us, the problem is that we don't know. Those assumptions are hard to satisfy. But theoretically, they're very important. And, and in fact, I think something similar is used to show that this invariant extended common filter will also converge. So you need to show that the eigenvalues are bounded, and they're not going to blow up for the systems that we're studying. All right, so we're going to build two filters, left invariant and right invariant. Left, uh, left invariant propagation uses this model. For the process model, we use exactly what we have. You plug in the mean, the estimate, right? And then you get the time evolution, we will discretize it later, and that will give us the typical time difference equation that you expect to see. The state at k plus one is evaluation of the state at time step k using the process model. Now we have a recipe to get the error dynamics for the noisy model. We know the error dynamics is like this. We will linearize this to find A. So the whole story for the propagation of prediction step is to find this A matrix. That's it. That's all you need to do. Once you have it, you can propagate the covariance using the error equation. Now, there is a time, the continuous time 
evolution equation for the covariance. This comes from the study of something like LQR or LQE, optimal control and linear, linear control and estimation. It is a more special form of the matrix Riccardi equation. We're not gonna drive it, but, so we can use all of the nice results from linear systems here, and that's what we're doing. Because the Lie algebra is just the Euclidean space, it's a vector space. So all those results are valid. This is a continuous time version of that. You are probably used to seeing the discrete time version of it. What about the correction step? The correction step you need to do a little more work. Do you remember what was the correction step of the linear Kalman filter? If I use this notation of plus for the correction, right? And TK is just to show that because the process was continuous, the correction is actually discrete because observations arrive at discrete time steps, whereas the process model is just a continuous differential equation. To keep the notation consistent, you see that we use T sub K. That means a particular time step in time, and T to emphasize that X is evolving with time. So that's the meaning of this notation. So for the linear Kalman filter, we had a linear correction formula, the result that was possible to prove it from multiple ways consistently would give us this formula that you can find an optimal filter gain when it's multiplied by the innovation, will add a correction to the previous estimate or the predicted estimate. And the innovation was, what was the innovation? The measurement minus your predicted measurement using the sensor model. So that was the innovation. Now, what is the equivalent of this linear update rule for a matrix Lie group? It is this exponential form because we had it for if you remember for propagation, we were doing this. This was the exact integration if during delta t omega is constant. So this is a natural way to accumulate updates for matrix groups using matrix multiplication. Why exponential? Well, because they update the innovation will be in the Lie algebra, as we'll see. And we need to take the exponential of it to convert it into a delta of a matrix and then accumulate it. In this case, it will be a delta rotation. So what we realized is that this observation model is in a vector space. This is a vector. The innovation is in the Lie algebra. It is not on the group. That's what is going on. Now you might say that why we see x here. This is different from the process model because x here is acting on a vector. It's like rotating it or moving it. This is not the same as x getting evolved um, over time with a process model. Okay, so there's no dynamics in x. It's just moving some constant vector b. 
that's allowed that we can do that. As we will see, that won't cause a problem. So analogous to that model, we have the exponential update. Multiply both sides by the true state. That will lead to the error after correction and the error before correction, right? Because we are at one particular time slice, before and after correction. Okay, so the only complicated term is the exponential term. Now the innovation term can be replicated here by substituting the equation that we had for the left invariant observation model. It was like this, right? To substitute it into the equation, that's what you get. Now, the first part, this is the inverse of the error. Times b, you have a minus b, and then some x bar inverse times b will just be there. Linearize, use the first order approximation of the exponential map Directly calculate, drop anything that is second order and above. That means when you get this term multiplied by another of itself or noise, drop them. You only keep the first order, that's the meaning of linearization. The direct calculation will give you this update rule for the error. L is, by the way, L is filter gain. I'm calling it L because reserving K for some modified version of it. So, and by the way, the innovation is this term here. I'm gonna delete all the mess I made. This is the innovation. If y is x, b, x inverse y minus b is the innovation. Just like when z was h times x, z minus hx was the innovation. And you need to redefine it because noise has a zero mean white Gaussian distribution. And then you can, I don't know, you could define this to be the innovation. So we do what we can based on the rules that we have to follow, which is a matrix multiplication. So this is nice. We have update an update rule for the error as we obtain measurement. Now we only derive this once. You will never derive it again, right? When you want to use it. We're just doing it one time. Now, remember for the process model, we only needed to find the A matrix, that was our job. For the correction, it turns out that we can make a recipe that if you find the H matrix using this equation, you're done. You can just implement the filter, okay? So I simplified it for you. And I give you the algorithm. This is the recipe, find A, find H. You're ready to implement the invariant Kalman filter. So the usage somewhat is a straightforward. The path is involved.
So if we know the observation, uh, the error update rule based on the observation, which we derived it on the previous page, we need to keep all the error terms in, in the form of vectors. Because this one has a wedge, right, times B, define a matrix H, when you multiply it by this vector of the error in the Lie algebra, will be equivalent of this C wedge or hat times B. How to get it in practice, you need to write it, write it down, expand it, and see what you get. We have an example. For the left invariant model, use this. For the right invariant, it will be similar, but it has a negative sign. You need to be careful if it's the left invariant or the right invariant. So once you define H, you can substitute it into the equation, and you get the final form. And in fact, this will give you that numerically stable equation for covariance update that we had, right? Now, this should be familiar for you. You had it in a linear Kalman filter, or a EKF after linearization. And N here is the noise covariance. Now, the way I'm getting it, I'm taking the covariance of both sides. Take the covariance of the both sides, then you arrive at the update equation for the covariance of the state. Um, from the update step, we are conditioning the state on our measurements, yeah. and they're jointly um, Gaussian. Does this follow that same step that we use for the Gaussian filters, or? Um, it does. Yeah, the question is, this is the same way to derive the previous case. It is, but in this particular case, it's easier to work like this, because we're working with matrices. It will make it complicated. You could use this method to derive the previous column filter. However, you, the reason I avoided in the Kalman filtering lecture to derive the filter like this is you need to prove that that equation for the filter gain is the optimal gain. And it's not hard. You, you minimize, you solve an optimization problem by minimizing the trace of the covariance or the error. And, or minimum mean squared error, and then you show that that's the optimal filter gain, and you arrive at the same result. In this case, because we're working on a matrix group, it's easier to manipulate terms algebraically. And I don't, I'm not gonna prove the gain, I'll just refer, refer to the Kalman filtering theory that we know what's the filter optimal gain in a vector space. Again. Algebraic manipulation means everything that I'm doing here. Multiplying matrices by vectors, matrices by matrices, inverting a matrix, adding terms. It's not geometric, right? Can you repeat it? Y, L, T, K. Why do we have this L here? So the question is, why do we have this L here? Because if we don't have it, we are just integrating the error. We want to 
have a filter gain, just like right? If you remove the filter gain from Kalman filter, we'll just have to add the innovation. Yeah, so this L is like the filter gain. So this is similar to K times new, right? Now, once you go through the implementation, you realize why. And I might have it later. There are some bunch of zeros and stuff that you need to remove because of multiplying these matrices. I'm reserving K for the final cleaned version of the filter game. But it is, uh, in the end, it's just a notation. So the filter gain times the innovation, we integrate it or add it using the exponential term. So to summarize, the left invariant filter has a process model, has a differential equation for the covariance, which we will discretize in practice to use. And there's an update rule that uses the measurement model to define the innovation and a filter gain to update the covariance and the state. Now the filter gain, it is the same equation as in the linear Kalman filtering. Your covariance times measurement Jacobian transpose times the inverse of the innovation matrix. The in innovation is exactly the same formula. So the equations are the same. What about the right invariant? Same idea. You just need to, the process model won't change, whether it's left or right, you work with the same. You pick the right invariant error process. We will have to work with that. And that has a different form. And then your equations will be like this. The first part is the same. The second part has an adjoint term. Now, although it looks the same, but these matrices are not the same. The covariance of the left invariant filter, it is not the same as the right invariant filter. There is a way to map them, transform them to one another, but they are not the same. You need to be careful not combining them carelessly. Because ultimately they are in a different reference frame. One is the body, one is the world. You won't get the same values in, in the entries of the matrix. Now we follow the same ideas for the update part. I save you the headache. And then the summary is do the same thing for the process model. You have a propagation for the covariance. Although it's a different matrix, it has, for the most part, a similar form. Correction is the same. However, in the right invariant, the exponential is on the left side, or you can think about it as state estimate is on the right side. Whereas the previous one, the order was swapped. Now, this, is, this should not be surprising because we have two options for defining the error. And based on that, you get to see the exponential on one side. And because of that, the right invariant is like this. However, we can give it meaning. The innovation in the right invariant filter is in the spatial frame. It's in the world frame. The innovation in the left invariant filter is in the body frame. Geometrically, that's how we're doing it. If you work with the inverse of the matrix as your state, you need to flip the, flip what I said. If instead of the rotation, you're estimating the inverse of the rotation, that it is perfectly fine to do, then the left invariant innovation will be in the spatial frame, right? So, so you get four different forms 
based on whether you work with the state or the inverse of the state. And each of them has these two forms. And it's not really important which one you choose. Some, some forms are naturally better for some problems. All right, so that's I think we can stop after this example because I want to spend next lecture talking about IMU and how to combine IMU and GPS maybe in a left invariant filter. And we don't have time. I want to dive into the equations in peace, not rushing through them. So a velocity motion model. Consider a robot moving in 2D or 3D. The state evolves on SE2 or SE3. Just like the gyroscope, we can have the differential equation of the Lie group. However, now we're working with the twist, rotation and translation. So the U is the input, which is a vector of angular velocity or line and linear velocity. It is a three vector if it's SE2, and it's a six vector if it's SE3. The first question, okay, do you want to solve this problem? Then you, you need to answer that, is this process model group affine? Let's find out. So we have this process model, The group affine property was telling us that these two must be equal. So plug in x1 times x2 into the equation, we get x1 times x2 times u. Evaluate the right-hand side of the group affine property, which was this form f of x1 times x2 plus x1 times f of x2 minus x1 times the process model at the identity times x2. Carry on the calculation, simplify, you do get the same answer. So the two sides of the equality are the same, therefore the system is group affine. Now if the system is group affine, let's pick a right invariant filter here. I know the aerodynamics already, pick the aerodynamics, it has this form. To find A, you don't need to work with the noisy aerodynamics, right? Because that part is the same, it just has a noise. So pick the aerodynamics, you get zero. Which is what exactly what you get if you go back to the gyroscope example and do it with the right invariant error. You get zero. So for a native differential equation of the Lie group, when you do right invariant calculation, you get zero. So it means that the error, pro the error in the Lie algebra evolves based on this differential equation. The time evolution of the error is zero. Therefore, A is zero. That's as good as it gets. Sorry, could you explain again why this is the case with the right invariant? Based on the equations that we had from the theorem, theorem one was giving us the error equation. And the way to prove it is that start from the definition of the error to be right or left, take the derivative, and then see what is the class of function that satisfies that, which gives you the error group affine property. And then the error equation ends up being like this. So it's not something we choose. It happens because of the definition of the error. And it's not something that you can imagine easily. You define the error correctly, look for that property, you get this result. I guess I'm trying to get like the physical intuition for, so, so 
the right of Mary, he said, is in the world frame, and then the left is within the body frame. Mm-hmm. Um, so the error being, the, the, the rate of change for the error being zero in the world frame, while it's not in the body frame, is, I guess, where kind of the mismatch is happening. The gap grasping the intuition between the difference. The rate of change of the error is zero. Now I have to think about it myself as well. The right invariant, the the error is like this, right? So the error is seen in the world frame, or spatial frame. The equation is saying that your error evolution basically zero, it doesn't evolve with time. It's constant, right? Well, that means that when you integrate that deterministic process, it doesn't add any error. If you have an initial error, it will stay there forever. Right? This is a result that something like 20 years ago, people knew in Islam, in EKF Islam. You initialize the robot with some uncertainty, that will never disappear. That's very surprising. This, I think, based on your question, I think this means that if you have any uncertainty, it won't disappear, but it doesn't add anything to it. Later, when we have noise, we will add the noise, of course. But just mere integration of the control input, it does not grow the error, which is nice. Moving in the group is free game. I forgot that this was a deterministic system, that's, that's why, that's where Yeah. We do have the noisy equation in the Kalman filter, but to get to find the A matrix, you can work with the deterministic model. So the problem is the robot is moving in this map. I just simulated something very simple. The robot starts here, goes around. Back to the first spot. We have a bunch of landmarks. It is, of course, simulation. You can control how much of the, how many you see, how many at a time, what is the frequency, and all of that. But uh, the robot at any time maybe sees a landmark. The map is given. This is just a localization. The robot has a prior map knowing what's the exact location of these landmarks in the map. So the equation of motion in SE2 is what we just discussed. We have the twist, and then we integrate to know how the robot is moving. Then we want to implement a right invariant EKF to localize the robot. Maybe I show you. videos first. So this is just the propagation step, prediction step. No, no correction, no observation. The robot moves around and of course it's just drifting because there's noise. So the noise will, so the input that the robot get it's not perfect, right? That's, that will make it jitter around. At some point, point, it will get lost unless it receives observations. So when it gets some observations, it gets to correct its position and orientation. Now, the observations are very limited, as you see. I'm not throwing a lot of observations. If you get two, three observations at a very high frequency, Basically, it's perfect. So the reason I'm not doing that because it will be so good that you don't see the covariance. So I'm 
cutting down on the observation so you can see the covariance grows as the robot moves in the prediction step, and it shrinks when you get an observation. In practice, you want high-frequency observations as much as possible, because that makes the filter work better. So back to, and you have, you have the code for this. You, you can go through it. So we have the rotation and position. Once we discretize the equations, the first part is, it should be familiar, integration rule on Lie group, previous state times exponential of the twist. Now the aerodynamic is, Zero. So the A matrix is zero. From discretization of the linear system, I think a while ago I shared the link, but if you don't remember, I can reshare it. If you have a continuous time system, there's a way to discretize it. You need to take a bunch of integrals. In this case, well, the transition matrix of the system is basically exponential of integral of A dt. You can approximate it for a delta t for sampling time if assuming A is constant. But in this particular case, A is constant all, all the time. So for a delta t time, this is a very easy discretization and it is in fact the identity because A is zero. So plug it to the discrete version of the propagation equation for the covariance. This is not different from a linear common filter. So state you had F sigma, F transpose, right? This, I'm just using different notation. This is, this is your F. And because it's the right invariant, if you go back to the equations, you need to use the adjoint to map the noise. because noise is defined in the Lie algebra. You have to map it where you are. And naturally the adjoint shows up in the algebraic calculations. So the covariance is propagated like that, which ends up being the previous covariance plus some noise term, which makes the covariance to grow. Now when you're given a continuous time process model and noise, that covariance is called the noise density. It's not the same thing as the discrete, times, discrete time noise covariance. A simple way to discretize the noise density covariance is a uh, matrix is using the state transition matrix to map it and times delta t. Again, follows from discretization of linear systems. And we can approximate it like this. Right? So use this equation if you're lazy, and it's usually good. And you do need usually to tune it, right? In your assignment, that's the problem. You don't know the noise. Even if the data sheet is telling you, if you're running the robot in cold and warm weather, that's, that's very different from the numbers you're reading from laboratory calibration. What about the correction? Now, this is new to you. The correction is a right invariant. That's why we chose a right invariant filter. Because you know that the observation, the, let's say this y is a measurement of the landmark location, x, y, right? It's something like this. Right? If I have a 2D robot, landmark from the map, and this is a robot
position. So the measurement model for this type of problem in localization in the SLAM is that, well, you know where the landmark is in the map. That's, the, by the way, vector B is constant. M is given. I know it. It's hard-coded in my algorithm. Now, when I see that landmark, the difference from the landmark and the robot position, that's the vector that will connect the robot to the landmark, right? Rotate it with R transpose to be in the body frame. That's what your sensor is actually seeing. The sensor will see a relative position. Range or bearing or x, y, whatever you want to calculate. So the sensor will not observe, of course, local position of the landmark. Now we arrange this into a matrix like this, and then we recognize that, well, this is x inverse. We call this b. So we call b whatever is constant and is convenient. It makes this equation to match the right invariant. Plus some noise, I need to append 0 to make sense of the dimension. And I'm working with uh, homogeneous coordinates. So I have these one appended into the vectors. So the observation is naturally right invariant. And it does have a very simple geometric meaning. Although when you look at it like this, it might be a little obscure. So for the correction, we need to find h. For the right invariant, you do have a negative sign. Expand the twist in the Lie algebra, carry on the calculations, try to separate it into the vector. Whatever is left, that's your h. It's usually calculated like this. Okay? Expand it and then find the matrix h that satisfies this equation. Notice that we have a row of zeros. So there's going to be a bunch of zeros and ones to match the dimensions of these nodes and vectors and matrices. You need to implement it and get a feeling about it. You can do better by getting rid of those somehow in implementation. Or you can just be inefficient and track longer or bigger matrices. One important problem. Now we are able to do observability analysis just using linear systems theory for a problem that was thought to be nonlinear because of the rotation, and this was not possible. So the observability analysis in the Lie algebra using the measurement model, we form the Gramian using the measurement Jacobian and which is a constant matrix and system transition matrix, and it's a constant. It is clear that the first column is a linear combination of the second and third. The angular velocity was the first column, first dimension of the state. So the rotation is not observable by just observing one landmark. You will never make it observable by just getting one landmark and cor correcting sequentially. So let's make an attempt and collect two landmarks and run correction with two measurements at one time. When you do that, you need to stack your measurements for this particular measurement model. You need to make a block diagonal matrices, stack B and B, two measurements. When you do that, you can see that the Gramian is full rank. The state is observable. For with two landmarks, orientation is observable now. You can try it in 3D to see what happens, how many landmarks you need. If the robot was a quadrator moving in 3D, you want it to localize, is it one, two, three? You can do it exactly like this. So take a look at the code. That will replicate what you saw in the video. And 
that's the end of today's lecture. Next time we'll talk about IMU and IMU GPS filter and revisit some of the uh, some other examples.